Hi, welcome back to our lecture. Let's start by looking at cloud native application architecture patterns. And the first thing to understand is that cloud native application architecture is fundamentally different than our traditional application architecture. And if you remember back to the beginning of this course, we talked about distributed application architecture versus monolithic applications. Monolithic applications are those, those sort of traditional applications that we would build. It was a, a, an application where all of our code and services were combined into a, a single application that we would run, or a single service that was responding to all of the API requests. And yes, we may have, we may have built sort of multi multi-tiered applications where we have a client tier and an application tier and, and, and a back-end database tier. But fundamentally, all the business logic that was located in that application tier was running within a monolithic application. And these, these sort of legacy monolithic applications were really never designed to scale that well in a, a cloud environment. Our, our legacy applications were designed to run on highly resilient infrastructure. And you know by now that cloud infrastructure is, is really sort of supposed to be brittle in, in, in comparison. I mean, it, you know, we don't run EC2 instances for a long period of time. We don't really care if an EC2 instance fails because we can easily redirect our request to a different EC2 instance where our application is running. When we design our modern distributed applications, our, our software is deployed across dozens or even hundreds of EC2 instances. Now, it's, it's definitely technically possible to move a legacy application to the cloud, but you're going to really lose, uh, you know, many of the benefits that the cloud offers, such as as elasticity. How do you take that that legacy application, which is storing state locally on a server, and how do you you know how do you provide for high availability in the, in the cloud? that's challenging to do. You might have to actually re-architect or even rewrite portions of your application to run well within the cloud. And that's actually one of the biggest mistakes that I see companies making. They, they think of the cloud as just another place that they can host their applications and data. So they take their traditional applications and just try to, try to lift and shift them into a cloud environment and they find that, well, gee, the, the cloud environment isn't isn't actually any more reliable than you know where they were hosting their applications in their in their corporate data center. Well, that's because your applications weren't really designed to run in the cloud. They weren't really designed with with a distributed architecture and the really the really the the resilience of the distributed architecture in mind. So. Uh, one thing that's interesting is that uh, companies like AWS are now starting to offer services um, like like the AWS Outpost service, which allows you as a, as a company to stand up a set of racks in your on-premise corporate data center and, and actually run some AWS services from within your, your own data center. Essentially, AWS is creating an outpost within your corporate data center, and, and your data center then appears like almost like another region within AWS. So it's it's an it kind of an interesting move on AWS's part, and I think it's it's the purpose of that is to you know is uh, you know some companies just uh, aren't aren't comfortable with running services in a, a public cloud provider. And so uh, the fact that the equipment is in their local data center might give them more comfort, but also think that it's a way to sort of ease the transition of legacy applications from the data center ultimately uh, into the public cloud.
So what do these what do these modern cloud native applications look like? Well, modern cloud applications are generally composed of many small services. So we partition our application into multiple services called microservices. Instead of running everything in in a single service and in, in, you know under a single monolithic code base, we have multiple services, each of which has its own unique function and, and own unique purpose. One of the interesting um, things that results from a microservices sort of architecture is that the services actually become very dependent on the, the underlying network layer for all of their application service communications. When you think about like a monolithic sort of stack that's running on a single server, if you have one process that needs to communicate with another process, it just happens within memory using inter-process communications. But when you have multiple services that are distributed across many different EC2 instances, then the only way they can really communicate is by using a, a network layer. And these these cloud native applications will generally leverage many of the different managed services provided by the public cloud provider. If we are building out a cloud native application, then we, we would probably forego building our own like MySQL database and deploying it on our own managed EC2 instance and instead just use AWS RDS, the relational database service, and allow, allow AWS to manage the database service for us. So when we're building our cloud native application, we're trying to leverage as many of those managed services a as possible so that we can really focus our time and attention on building the business logic which is unique to our particular application. When we build our model, when we build our, our microservices based cloud native platform, we're deploying those services across multiple availability zones and even potentially multiple regions. And, and that's how we gain very, very high resiliency. Our application is able to withstand the loss of you know entire data centers and that would be very very difficult to do with a traditional traditional application uh, it it uh, you know typically with traditional applications you have your primary data center facility where you're hosting your application and then you might have a disaster recovery site so if your primary data center catches fire is is destroyed by a tornado then then you can fail over services to the the disaster recovery site. But with a cloud native application platform, our, our, our software and our platform is distributed across multiple data centers and all of those data centers are participating in, in, in supporting our platform in, in real time. So, and that means you know, much greater resiliency for us. I wanted to show this this diagram uh, because I think it it's a really interesting example of how a cloud native application might work today, and one that's based around microservices. This is a this is a diagram showing the callout patterns from a homepage request that is made to the Netflix homepage. What's happening is that you can imagine on the, on the sort of on the far left, you are sitting at your web browser and you make a request to the Netflix homepage. That single request that you are making to the homepage results in a number of back end requests that are made by Netflix to other services. And these other services are used to, to actually build that homepage and provide you with a, a homepage which you know might be unique for your particular account with recommendations and 
images of movies and TV shows, etc. The important thing here to note is that that single request fans out to a handful of requests. And those handful of requests, each of, each of those individual requests also fans out to more requests and, and so on. And the end result is that your, the single request that you make to, to that Netflix homepage will result in hundreds of back-end requests to additional services, all of which you know, is going to be used to compose that, that single page f- for you. And, and, and so most people don't realize that th- this is what is happening uh, on, on the back end. And because of the scale of requests that are being made and the number of services that are, are, are involved, um, that presents some really interesting engineering challenges. The, the, the biggest challenge you face is this danger associated with the cascading service calls. You know, from the left to the right, ultimately that one request that you're making to the Netflix homepage might be, you know, might, might generate requests to hundreds of different services. Now, e- even if those services were all available 99.999% of the time, because there are so many requests being made, then uh, even with that very, very high level of resiliency, only 99% of requests would actually be fulfilled. In other words, some small percentage of requests would always fail. Now, now you can imagine with a, you know, a company like Netflix with millions and millions of customers, they would have a real problem on, on their hands if they could only service 99% of the requests because 1% of, of you know, requests that would fail would represent millions of unhappy customers. So you know, how, do they, how do they mitigate this, this particular problem? Well, we'll look at some, some uh, application design patterns here shortly that uh, companies will use to, to mitigate uh, some of the issues associated with, you know, supporting um, requests in, in, in a microservices sort of architecture. But there's sort of two quick ways, two quick things I can mention that we can use to mitigate some of these problems. One is we can just, we can introduce retries. In other words, if one service is trying to connect to another service, and that the service it's trying to connect to isn't available, then the, the service that's initiating the connection can just simply try, retry to connect at a later point in time. And, and retries are really important in a distributed uh, architecture, and we'll take a look at those in, in a little bit more detail here shortly. The other thing we can do is we can cache requests. You know, if one service needs to talk to another service and it's requesting some some information, if that information isn't changing all that often, then perhaps the information can simply be cached. That way you don't have one service that's, you know, sort of constantly hammering another service and, and asking it for, for information. And, and so an organization like Netflix will make heavy use of caching when it, when it comes to producing and composing its, its homepage. That's one of the reasons why it can produce those pages very, very quickly because some of the information on the page has, has already been cached in memory. And, and, and finally, uh, you know, what we'll, what we'll see, and uh, I'll describe it here next, is that many of our modern applications are moving towards what we call an event-driven model. And the event-driven model sort of fundamentally changes the way that the application is architected. And in many ways, it can make the application less brittle because it allows us to decouple services from one another. One service isn't as dependent on another service. If a, you know, if a, if a, if if a one service is relying on information from a second service, and that second service were to fail, then in in an event driven model, that failure wouldn't have as big of an impact. 
let's start out by looking at a pattern that we call the the orchestrator pattern. This is a this is a fairly traditional a application pattern where we have a service and in this case we'll call it the orchestrator service. This is a service that depends on a number of different services. You can imagine that you're making a request to a service and in order for that service to respond back to you, that service must communicate with three other services, service A, service B, and service C. So you make a request to the orchestrator service. The orchestrator service then makes a request to service A, waits for a response, then makes a request to service B, waits for a response, makes a request to C, waits for a response back. And then once it receives the responses from those three, those three services, it will respond back to you. This is a very, very traditional pattern. And in fact, like most, most applications, like many web applications that I have worked with over the last 20 years have used this very traditional request response pattern. Sometimes we call request response a, a synchronous request where a, one service is making a, a call to another service and it's, it's going to sit there and wait for a response from the service. And it won't move on. It won't continue, you know, processing until it receives a response. We call that as sort of a synchronous request. And the, the connection request is held open. Well, this sort of pattern, it's very, very common, but it also presents uh, 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 some issues for us. You know, the, the big issue is that it tightly couples these services together. The orchestrator service is completely dependent on service A, service B, and service C. And if if um, you know if one of these services were to fail, then the orchestrator service is is probably not going to be able to respond properly. Or even if the orchestrator service were to fail, the orchestrator service is the only way we can get information from service A, service B, service C. So the orchestrator service itself is, is sort of a, a single point of failure for us. A more modern software application development pattern is what we call a reactive pattern. And this is, this is a, an event-driven application development model. In an event-driven model, we essentially have sort of a shared message bus that we call the event stream. We have services then which are connected to this event stream. So you have service A, which is producing messages and putting them on the event stream. And it's, it's also consuming messages that might appear on the event stream. And the same thing for service B and service C. What's interesting is that these three services don't actually have to know anything about one another. They, they're all connected to the same event stream, but service A doesn't really need to know anything about service B or, or service C. And, and because th th these dependencies don't exist, it, it's easier then for us to make modifications to the individual services because they're not dependent really on any any uh, on any other service now they all might be sort of dependent on on the, the sort of the the format of the message that appears on the event stream but again these services aren't aren't directly dependent on one another the other interesting thing is that these three, three services are really could could operate very independently meaning that they can they can actually um, process transactions in parallel. Service A can be consuming messages from the event stream the same time service B and service C are. And, and so there's, there's, no, there's no single orchestrator sort of service which is sort of, you know, managing the, the scheduling or the processing of tasks and, you know, and uh, using these various services. They're all act acting as sort of independent actors all connected to a common event stream. This, this reactive pattern 
really makes a lot of sense in a, in a microservices architecture where you have very small services that are highly distributed and they're, they're generally very decoupled from one another. And, and the only way that they're communicating in, in many cases is via some sort of some sort of event stream where they're producing and consuming messages from. Now, to be honest, many, many developers have no experience using the sort of modern reactive pattern. And, uh, it's, and, and there's a bit of, of a learning curve from an architecture perspective and, and sort of designing and re-architecting your, your application to use this, this sort of pattern. The thing is, the, 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 the organizations and the development teams that are able to leverage this sort of pattern are generally much, much more productive and are able to, to build applications which are much, much more resilient than applications which are designed using a, you know, a, tish, a traditional request response pattern. Now, that's not to say that like everything should be reactive. That, that's not the case. There are some parts of your application platform which have to follow a request response platform. But in, in many cases, you can, you can sort of refactor your application to use more of a reactive pattern. And if you can do that, you'll gain some, some huge benefits. I want to just show you kind of an ex a simple example that uh, that shows the difference between that request response pattern and a reactive or event driven model. And this is an example where we, we've got um, kind of like a, a very basic social media site where you have connections, you know, these are like friends and your uh, connections are making posts and you create this connections posts service. The, the purpose of that is that you want to be able to view all of the posts and the, on this, the social media uh, site that are made by your friends or made by your connections. And so with a traditional request response application architecture, you would make a request to the connections posts service, and then that service would turn around and make a request to the connection service, getting a list of your connections, and then it would make a request to the posts service, getting a list of the posts that have been made by your connections. And so the, the, all the, that information would come back to the connections posts service, and that then would respond back to you, you know, to basically to your web browser. Now, the problem with this, of course, is like what happens if the connections service is unavailable when you make this request? If you make a, that request, the connections post service will respond, but it's no longer able to communicate with the connections service. That's broken. And so you won't be able to uh, process that request. Maybe you, you, know, you, you would design it with a retry in place. Um, but depending on how long the connection service is down, it, it, it might not, um, you know, it might not be responsive right away. The, um, the event driven model or the reactive model changes things a bit. Now our, our client web browser is still making a request to the connections posts service and it's waiting for a response. It makes that request, but the connections post service doesn't make a request to the connection service and the post service because the connection service is out there waiting for new connections to be made. So waiting for you to make new connections. Anytime it makes a new connection, it will send out an event to the connections post service and tell the connections post service that you've added a new connection. So the connections post service will probably have its own state. It'll have its own database where it's storing a list of your connections. Therefore, it doesn't need to go out and, and, and ask the connection service who your connections are. It already knows because it received an, a notification via an event 
that you had added a new connection. And likewise, the post service, when your connection, one of your connections makes a post, that post event will be sent, also be sent to the, the connection service. And so your, your request can be completely fulfilled by the connections post service. It can respond back to you. It doesn't need to reach out and communicate with, with the connection service and, and the post service because those services that are communicating with the connections post service sort of proactively. Those services are sending events to the connections post service uh, for you so that when you, when you need to, to get that information, it's already there. It's, it's sort of ready to go. So sort of a very different way of designing an, an application. And I think you can begin to see how this might be much more resilient because these applications aren't tightly coupled. These services aren't tightly coupled together. The connections post service isn't dependent on the connection service and the post service, uh, you know, in, in, to be up to be up and running. So that that was the the uh, reactive pattern. I want to take a look at a couple other patterns that uh, are useful when building out a cloud native architecture, a highly di distributed microservices based architecture. You can imagine that when you're building out this cloud native architecture, you're going to have you know, potentially dozens, hundreds, maybe even thousands of services that make up your platform. And you're going to have services which are calling other services, and those services are calling other services, and so on. One of the big challenges that you might experience are, you know, issues related to sort of cascading service failures. Now, if I, we go back to this, this Netflix diagram, you can imagine like, what if we have a, a service in the middle here somewhere that's being called and by a number of different services and maybe the service that's being called it isn't performing well maybe it's performing really slowly for a particular reason and that will cause the the services that are are making calls to that service it'll cause delays in those services it causes it causes sort of like a pile up you can imagine like cars that are flying down the highway and you have an accident somewhere and it's causing traffic to back up. The same thing can happen in our uh, highly distributed microservices sort of architecture. So if we have, if we have services that are, which are generating a huge amount of demand for a shared service, the, the, the shared service may become unresponsive and that can cause a set of cascading failures in other parts of the platform. Now, the way we can deal with this issue is by implementing what we call the circuit breaker pattern. You know that like in, in your house, a circuit breaker is, is a way, is, is a you know, technology that's used to protect an electrical line. If you have an electrical line in your house, it can support, you know, maybe it's a 15 amp line. It can only support a certain number of devices connected to it. And if you overwhelm that circuit with too many devices, what will happen is the wire will actually heat up and that could, that could cause your house to start on fire. And so the way to mitigate that failure is by adding a circuit breaker into the line. And when the circuit breaker senses that there is too much amperage being pulled on that line, it will trip and it will essentially shut off that line and uh, won't allow uh, the devices connected to the line to, to consume power. We can do the same thing in our, our microservices environment. If we have a, you know, services that are trying to invoke one another, they can try to invoke one another through an abstraction layer, which kind of acts like a traditional electrical circuit breaker. So if you have one service that is trying to make requests to another service and 
those requests are, you know, so it's kind of retrying over and over again to, um, to make a request to a second service. And that second service is maybe, uh, is maybe unresponsive. After a certain amount of time, that might trick that might uh, trip a circuit breaker, which will cause the it will essentially halt the communication for a, a, a period of time, and that will sort of prevent one service from potentially overwhelming another service and causing the sort of cascading failures within our application platform. Another approach that we can use to sort of mitigate failures within a shared platform is by implementing a bulkhead pattern. Now, the, the bulkhead pattern is named after the, the bulkheads that you commonly find in ships. And the idea is that you have a ship and you partition the ship into multiple sections. In each section, is essentially like a watertight compartment. You access, you, you, you pass from one section of the ship to another section via a, a doorway, a hatch essentially, which uh, has a watertight seal. The idea is that if a, a leak were to form in one portion of the ship, that leak wouldn't quickly overwhelm and fill up, you know, the entire body, the body of the ship, effective, effectively sinking the ship. Instead, just one compartment within the ship would flood, but the rest of the ship would be dry and, and would still be able to float. So, th the way this relates to a, a sort of a shared application architecture is: imagine you have a a platform that you're supporting in the cloud and you have a hundred different customers that are using the, this platform. And, and, and this is actually based on an example of, I'm thinking of from a few years ago where I, I worked with a company that had, you know, I think they had maybe a, a 200 customers or something. And, but one of those customers represented about 40% of their demand, about 40% of, of the traffic and application demand on their platform. And th so the challenge is that you could have one platform, one customer on your platform that is generating so much demand on your platform that it could be impacting the services that are provided to us, other customers on the platform. You know, often, oftentimes we call this the noisy neighbor problem where you have like one one neighbor, one customer that is causing trouble for everybody else. Well, one of the solutions to, to this is to implement the bulkhead pattern, which involves essentially partitioning our, our services. So if we have, in this example, we have three customers. Each customer would have a different service instance that they're communicating with. You could imagine it like almost like we're taking our our platform and we're are, are sort of replicating our platform three times. We have three separate individual platforms and, and customer one is going to, you know, our first instance of our platform, customer two, the second instance, customer three, the third instance. That way, if if our customer one were to, you know, place a lot of demand on the platform, it would really only impact their particular service instance. Our, our other customers would be unimpacted by the, the demands placed on our platform by, by client one. I mentioned earlier that retries play a big role in you know, mitigating service failure within a cloud native application architecture. You know, anytime you're running a big platform in the cloud, we, we, we're talking about hundreds of instances or hundreds of different services, you're going to experience transient failures over time. It's just it's simply uh, you know, the nature of the cloud architecture. And, and it's something that you, we, need to, we need to plan for and design around in our 
software applications. And, and one of the ways that we can design around these transient failures is by implementing a retry pattern, which is simply means that if you have a service that is calling another service, the, the calling service, if it's not able to connect, it will just simply try to reconnect with that service after a certain period of time. So we introduce a, some sort of de a delay between the, the reconnection attempts. One of the potential problems that you could cause by, by implementing retries is that you could potentially generate what we call a retry storm. And that is like, imagine like you have some sort of shared service which fails. All of the different services which are trying to access that shared service would then begin retrying their, uh, retrying their connections. And uh, they, they could be retrying their connections so rapidly or so frequently that just the act of trying to retry those connections could overwhelm that particular shared service. And so to mitigate that potential for a retry storm, what we, what, what we tried to do in practice is we implement what's called an exponential backoff delay, which means that, like a simple example is that the first time a a service tries to tries to you know reconnect it will wait a second and then the second time it tries to reconnect it will wait 2 seconds the third time it'll wait 4 seconds the fourth time it'll wait 8 seconds and so on so we have this sort of exponential increase in the in the delay between retry attempts and and that's a way to essentially sort of slow down the the frequency of retries and so that we don't generate these big retry st uh, storms and, and overwhelm our shared services. Oftentimes when we have a, a traditional application, this again is sort of our, our monolithic application, that monolithic application might be loading in some data, and then it's performing a number of different steps or different tasks to process that data and transform the data using some set of, of business logic. So the, the key here is that you have a monolithic, a monolithic application and it's perf performing a whole series of different tasks to, to transform data. When we move this sort of data transformation process into a cloud native platform, we try to implement a pattern called the pipes and filters pattern, which is a way of sort of partitioning all of these different data transformation steps into individual components, individual tasks each of which could be its own microservice. So you can imagine that you have a microservice called task A and it's receiving in incoming data. It's, process it's processing that data and then it's going to send that data to a second task, uh, task B. It's gonna process the data and then send the, the data to another task or another microservice called task C and so on. The, 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 the services are communicating one, uh, uh, with one another in a sort of sequential fashion to transform the data. The key here is that you don't have a single service which is doing all of the data transformation tasks. Each service is only handling one individual task and, and they're forming essentially a pipeline where, where the tasks are being sort of connected together sequentially in order to produce the desired uh, transformed data. The, the last pattern I want to uh, talk about in this section of the lecture is what we call the compensating transaction pattern. Sometimes it's also called the saga pattern. And so you, you can imagine where you have all of these different microservices, each of which has its own 
uh, own purpose. You you could have one microservice, and, and you know, imagine like you have a, a hotel and flight booking uh, platform. You know, it, and there's like lots and lots of these types of platforms on the internet. So you you your platform might have a service which is responsible for hotel bookings. It would have another service which is responsible for flight bookings, and another service which is responsible for booking car rentals. And as as a customer goes through the process of of you know sort of booking all of these services, what happens? How do you deal with a situation where you experience some sort of service failure in the middle? of a transaction um well if, if you know if you had were able to book your hotel and you were in the middle of booking your flight and there was some sort of service failure you could then try to roll back the transaction using some sort of state machine model and and uh so every every service transaction would have its sort of a, a an opposite uh, transaction, what we call a compensating, uh, a compensating action, which would negate the action that that service is taking. For example, if you have a, a, a service which allows you to book hotels, then you have a sort of a compensating service that allows you to cancel hotels. And if you have a service that allows you to can uh, to to book flights, then you have a service that allows you to cancel flights. And then the state machine looks something like this, where the customer books a hotel, and if they're able to book a hotel, then they can book the flight. If they can book the flight, then they they can book the car rental, and then end the transaction. Otherwise, if they're if they try to book the hotel and that fails, then it would call a compensating action, uh, which is the cancel hotel action.